Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Israel, and I'm happy to welcome all of you to a tumor board that's been organized here at ICRF for you. And hopefully this will be an educational opportunity. Um, I retired as the Cancer Center Director at Dartmouth Medical School a few years ago. And uh, there I was a pediatric oncologist and a cancer researcher. And now I'm uh, honored to have an opportunity to serve as the uh, executive director at ICRF. Um, the Israel Cancer Research Fund is a 45 year old charity. Um, we have a very simple mission. We raise funds for cancer research in North America and we fund research proposals in Israel. And over the past 40 years or so, we've funded about $70 million worth of cancer research, 2,500 grants. And at the present time, we're funding 70 different projects, pretty much at all the major biomedical research centers in Israel. Um, each of those projects is chosen from about 150 to 175 proposals that we receive each year. And uh, we're delighted to have you join us, learn a little bit about our organization and also have an opportunity to hear from some distinguished clinicians in your uh, region who have been willing to uh, donate their time to share an important perspective on how cancer diagnoses are dealt with. Um, tumor boards are an interesting phenomenon. They really represent a, uh, a recognition by uh, clinicians that cancer requires a multidisciplinary approach and that uh, the explosion of information in all of the different disciplines that are relevant for taking care of patients uh, with cancer uh, is challenging. And so we look to specialists to um, be the most knowledgeable possible, have the most knowledge possible about each of these different areas. And so at a tumor board, um, the physician who has initially met and examined uh, a patient presents the case um, to colleagues uh, who typically represent the major modalities of treatment and diagnoses um, that are critical for the care of cancer patients. And at major medical centers, these are regularly scheduled meetings and uh, at smaller uh, medical systems, um, they are oftentimes ad hoc, um, but they represent an opportunity for all of the physicians who are likely to be involved in an individual patient's care to come together and uh, share their knowledge, discuss the case, and then uh, seek a uh, integrated multimodality approach to therapy that they can all agree upon. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Richard Selkowitz, who is the Regional Medical Director of the Breast Cancer Program in Hematology and Oncology at St. Vincent Memorial uh, Medical Center, at St. Vincent's uh, Medical Center in Bridgeport, uh, which is associated with Hartford Healthcare. And he will introduce his colleagues and they will then um, uh, give you an example of how a tumor board proceeds. Dr. Selkowitz. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm a medical oncologist, and, and I think you said it well, Dr. Israel, uh, even for a patient with early stage breast cancer, it's really a multidisciplinary uh, approach. Um, we have some of the main components of that care plan here. We have Dr. Steve Cohen, who is a breast radiologist uh, at Stanford Hospital. He is a clinical assistant professor of radiology at the Frank Netta School of Medicine, which is Quinnipiac College. He is a senior partner at Advanced Radiology. He is a senior attending and chief of ultrasound at Bridgeport and St. Vincent's Medical Center. He's chief clinical developer, Advanced Radiology. He's a grandfather and he's a friend of mine since college, which is good or not good, I'm not sure. Dr. Helen Pass is our esteemed breast surgeon. Uh, she is the co-director of the Women's Breast Center 
and Chief of Breast Surgery at Stanford Hospital. She was formerly at Lawrence Hospital in Bronxville, as well as Chief of the Comprehensive Breast Care Center at William Beaumont Hospital in Michigan and University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center. She graduated from the University of Michigan School of Medicine, the General Surgery at University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, and Georgetown University in Washington, and completed a surgical fellowship. I'm just a neighborhood oncologist from Brooklyn, so my title is a little bit shorter, uh, but I am proud to be part of the team that takes care of women with breast cancer. What we're gonna do today is present a typical patient that we would discuss in tumor board, and we'll go through diagnosis, basically local control and systemic control, or how we manage the disease locally and prevent it from occurring somewhere else. The patient is a 52-year-old woman who had her screening mammogram, um, which was noted to have an abnormality. <clears throat> Excuse me. She had a biopsy, which revealed an invasive ductal carcinoma that was hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative. Her past medical history is unremarkable. Um, there is no family history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer. She is not Ashkenazi Jewish. She has not used birth control pills. Her physical exam is unremarkable. There is nothing that can be appreciated and exam by the patient or a physician. And she presents, she's presented to discuss further management strategies. Dr. Cohen, I don't think hey. I've called you Dr. Cohen before. I am not used to it. I, <laughs> and I'm sitting down. <laughs> um, maybe what you can do is most importantly discuss how important screening mammography is, uh, especially in a case like this, and what, what you look for and who should have a mammogram. Well, first of all, uh, I had two illustrative cases from this week, which uh, show you the spectrum in between uh, what we actually see clinically uh, and, 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 and sometimes what we uh, strive for. Uh, we had a young patient uh, who had a uh, previous breast reduction, and she had a small spiculated lesion that could have really represented fat necrosis. But this was a first mammogram, and we decided to biopsy it, and it came back uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. She had no idea she had it. She was completely asymptomatic. We also had a 52-year-old uh, woman who presented with uh, a questionable thickening in the breast, uh, she also had a speculated lesion, but it was larger. Uh, it was fairly obvious mammographically and very obvious sonographically. Uh, we biopsied that, and that was also a grade two invasive uh, mammary carcinoma. The point is, uh, the first woman was being screened. It was her first screening mammogram. It was a baseline study. How old the second was woman had not presented for a mammogram in eight years. How old was the first patient? I apologize. 41. 41. Now, we generally recommend uh, breast cancer screening in patients who are age 40, and uh, that's yearly screening, basically, uh, as long as they're healthy patients, which could extend into the 70s and 80s. If they essentially have a 10-year uh, life expectancy from the time that they're screened, that's, that's what we usually recommend. Now, there are a lot of uh, uh, controversial uh, issues regarding breast cancer screening. The U.S. Preventative uh, Service Task Force has recommended screening in people over 50 uh, and not to begin before then. We do not agree with that. The American Cancer Society, American College of Radiology definitely recommends screening beginning at age 40. Okay. And I, I think I can comfortably say that I would support that recommendation and I suspect Helen would also. Yes. So, so this patient had a mammogram and uh, there was no mass, the calcifications were seen. What would be the normal next step? If you see calcifications and you don't see a mass, you do a uh, breast localization and excision, or you could do a stereotactic breast biopsy. A stereotactic breast biopsy is performed using mammography. Uh, they're actually uh, quite uh, interesting and, and great new uh, technology when it comes to this. Uh, where the patients can be uh, visualized uh, tomographically. And the needle is basically guided using computer coordinates into the area of calcification. Then a vacuum type needle is used. The calcifications are extracted. 
and a specimen radiograph is taken and the specimen radiograph would tell us whether or not we got the calcifications or not. Uh, then that's sent to pathology and the pathologist would take a look at the tissue samples and uh, tell us basically what's going on. What do you do ultrasounds on? Uh, we do ultrasounds on patients who have dense breast tissue. Uh, the sensitivity of mammography diminishes as the density of the breast tissue increases. Uh, it makes it more difficult for us to see subtle carcinomas. And uh, therefore, we use ultrasound as an adjunct screening uh, modality. Uh, the other screening modality we use in higher risk patients is breast MRI. That's actually the most sensitive modality that we have. But uh, the standard armamentarium is uh, mammography that's been proven to save lives uh, and ultrasound is an adjunct in patients with dense breast tissue. So you go to a lot more cocktail parties than I do, uh, but I'm sure you're approached by people who say, can I just have an ultrasound instead of a mammogram? What do you say before you become inebriated? Right. Well, uh, even after I become inebriated, <laughs> I do tell them that they need a, a mammogram as well because they're complementary. They're not competitive studies. The kinds of things that we may see on mammography that you would not see on ultrasound would be uh, small calcifications, as you alluded to before, uh, small areas of speculation or architectural distortion, uh, and uh, sometimes even very small masses in a fatty breast. Uh, ultrasound doesn't help us that much in patients with fatty breasts. The sensitivity of mammography in those types of patients are, is actually quite good on the order of 85, 90%. So I think the two take home points are, is that you need to have a mammogram starting at the age of 40 and that ultrasound does not substitute, uh, ultrasound does not substitute for mammography. No, it's an adjunct study. It's, uh, it helps us make a diagnosis. It helps us if the breast tissue is dense, which could obscure a subtle lesion, but it is not the sine qua non. I also get a lot of inquiries from women about thermography, which uh, seems to be a somewhat popular uh, uh, way to help diagnose breast cancer. And we don't have anything in our literature that supports the use of th thermography. So there's no data to support the use of thermography as an alternative or even, or even as an adjunct. Correct. Unfortunately, we've had several women who have relied on that because they felt that that was the way to go. And uh, they presented with metastatic breast carcinoma because the thermography did not uh, pick it up. So, so, so Dr. Pass or Helen, um, uh, this, Steve does a biopsy on this woman and he calls and says she has an invasive ductal carcinoma, uh, it's hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative. Um, I'm going to send her over to see you. What, what, what's your discussion like? Well, you know me, I'm never short on opinions. So I actually want to roll back a couple of things. Not only is there no data to support thermography, women are very enamored with it because they think it's no radiation. Um, the FDA actually took the unusual step to condemn it. So not only is it not FDA approved, it's FDA condemned. I didn't know that. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, the next thing is that I always tell people the radiation exposure is incredibly small. Um, some studies say it's as small as flying from New York to California. So if you're willing to get on a plane to go see your grandkids, you should be willing to get your mammograms so you're still here to, to play with them. Um, next thing. Um, Steve's very modest, but as surgeons, we rely on our radiologist all the time. Our preferences for an image guided biopsy, if at all possible, who wants to go to the operating room to make a diagnosis? I much prefer if they can at all see it, that they should go ahead and do an image guided biopsy. It does not spread the cancer. Opening it to air does not spread the cancer. Having a diagnosis lets us approach it in a very thoughtful manner. Um, so when Steve calls me and tells me that, my first question is, does she need an MRI? Um, we don't do MRIs on everybody who has breast cancer. Sometimes the mammogram is just so clear. and There's not background densities, distortions that make you concerned. Um, we don't do it. But if we think that an MRI is going to give us increased clarity for the existing cancer, or we're afraid things could be hiding even in the other breast, um, sometimes we do an MRI before we proceed. Once the patient finally makes it to me, we do have a long conversation because there's a lot to consider and a lot of teaching to do. Um, the natural history of breast cancer, women hear breast cancer and just automatically assume that's it. 
I point out that October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and we have tens of thousands of women making walks because more women live than die from breast cancer. So women should not be afraid to get their screening mammogram because we may find something. They should be afraid not to get a mammogram because it's when we don't find things or we find things late that our options become limited from a surgical standpoint and the outcomes become worse. Um, nowadays, breast cancer is not a death sentence. It does not mean we're gonna chop off your breast. Um, even bigger cancers, we have lots of options working with our plastic surgeons to save their breasts if that's what they want. So the first discussion I have is, let's talk about the natural history of breast cancer and what you have. The next step is we talk about, can you be treated with surgery to save your breast? So how big is the lump compared to the size of your breast? What's your personal preference? Um, are you willing to have radiation if we're gonna save your breast with a lumpectomy or what we term breast conservation? Um, and how can we get you the best cosmetic approach? Some women have strong preferences and want mastectomies, so we explore why that is. I warn women, you do not live longer having your whole breast removed or having a mastectomy than having a lumpectomy. Survival is exactly the same. So again, it's other issues that are gonna push us in one direction or the other. For invasive cancers, we also talk about management of the lymph nodes. We no longer remove them all. The days of your great aunt having a giant swollen arm, we are long surpassed that. We actually have um, a very targeted way to approach the most important lymph nodes, which are the sentinel nodes. Um, the patients who need all their lymph nodes taken out are becoming less and less because as you know, and we talk all the time, I rely upon you guys to help maybe with other treatments, shrink big lymph nodes. And finally, if you need all your lymph nodes removed, we have treatment for it. And there's even surgical management of lymphedema or arm swelling with lymphovenous bypass and lymph node transfers that's showing very good results. If needed, I refer them to plastic surgery for either a better outcome after a lumpectomy or for consideration for reconstruction for a mastectomy. And at that point, their head is swimming. You know, I think one of the major points you raise is that lumpectomy and radiation are comparable to mastectomy. We live in a society where more is better and bigger is best, and, and that really doesn't apply here. And I think that um, while we always respect a patient's personal preference and their family history and their genetics, which are all super important to our decision-making tree, uh, mastectomy does not represent the only alternative and that does not represent the more superior alternative. Right. Throwing out normal tissue doesn't make anybody live longer. It gives them a bigger surgery and more recovery. So for local control, which, which we, I would consider you the captain of, you would work in conjunction with the radiation oncologist for the patient who opts for breast conservation. Absolutely. Right. So, so yes, yeah, so we have very good data that lumpectomy with radiation uh, will result in an equal curative outcome as it would be for mastectomy. So after your surgery, then what happens? Well, the one other thing I want to take a detour to also, because we keep saying this word genetics, but we haven't really spoken about it. Okay. Usually patients see the surgeon before the medical oncologist, because usually, not always, surgery comes first. So you have all the pathology results to make a better discussion regarding what comes next. There are times you go first and they need systemic therapy before surgery. But also while we're working towards surgery, it's important and more and more um, to look at the genetics. There's more than just the BRCA gene. There are many, many genes. So I tell people we wanna make sure we're not missing a referral to genetics, not necessarily because if they have a gene that increases the risk for breast cancer, we're gonna do a double mastectomy, but because they have family members that it's important, they may have other body parts that we wanna look at and they may choose to have a double mastectomy if they have the gene, but it's not mandatory. Um, so currently our guidelines for genetic testing and what in my mind I'm looking at when I see it is if the woman has breast cancer and she's under the age of 45, she should be referred to genetics. If she has a special type of breast cancer called triple negative and she's under 50, she goes to genetics. If she's Ashkenazi Jewish and has breast cancer, she doesn't need any more information than that. She goes and sees genetics. If they are a male breast cancer patient, they go to genetics. If they have ovarian cancer, you go to genetics automatically. And then there's this whole group of people saying, 
Well, if you're over 50, but you have two family members or you have had double breast or bilateral breast cancer, the nuances get a little more. But again, the reason we want to know is not just for them, their family members and their other body parts, but for instance, with a BRCA mutation, women who carry the BRCA gene, the cancer we just found is treated equally well with a lumpectomy or mastectomy, but their risk of developing a second breast cancer is significantly higher than the average woman with breast cancer. And that's why people elect a double mastectomy. So while we're doing everything else, that's really where we head to. Yeah, I think genetics is really a fascinating area, just looking back over the evolution of breast cancer and genetics. Uh, when we started with the BRCA gene and we evolved to do the BARD uh, test, and now we do these panels, and I am really surprised by the number of people who were initially negative that we have been able to identify mutations that have required at least some consideration for other screening modalities, such as colonoscopies and consideration for other parts of the body. So if you had your genetics 10 years ago uh, and you were negative, it may very well be that you need to have your genetics updated if you did not have a full panel, which we really would endorse. It and if you had your genetics 10 years ago, it took six weeks. If you right. have your genetic testing now, we can get preliminary stat results in 10 days and full panels now in three weeks. So it certainly helps you make a clinical decision of, to your approach. Right. In a timely manner. So, so for the typical patient and, the, and no patient is typical, but for the patient who, who typically has surgery first and has a lymph node evaluation then would end up coming to the medical oncologist. You alluded to certain situations, which I think are beyond the scope of this discussion, where we'll treat the patient before we'll do anything surgically. But for the typical patient who has a hormone sensitive tumor that's HER2 negative, typically after they've seen you and done surgery and plans are made for radiation, they'll come to the uh, medical oncologist to talk about systemic therapy. I try to simplify things uh, from a simple place called Brooklyn. And I tell people we do local therapy and systemic therapy or the breast and the rest. We want to make sure the disease does not come back in the breast area. And we want to make sure it doesn't come back in, in the distant site. And that's really the role of the medical oncologist. In a hormone sensitive tumor, the mainstay of that therapy is hormone manipulation. We have a couple of drugs for a premenopausal patient. Tamoxifen is the drug of choice for us. Um, it works for patients who are pre and post and perimenopausal. While it doesn't get the, the credit it deserves on the internet, it is really a wonderfully, a wonderful drug that has probably saved more lives in breast cancer than anything else. We have drugs that are a bit better in the menopausal patient. They're called aromatase inhibitors. And those are given to patients in other specific situations. Uh, that's the mainstay of preventing a breast cancer that's hormone sensitive from returning. Chemotherapy, the dreaded word, is really become less of a component for the hormone sensitive patients. Uh, biologically, we found that anatomy is kind of trumped by genetics and biology. So when I first went into practice, any tumor that was about three quarters of an inch, no matter what its profile was, got chemotherapy. Uh, with the advent of these genomic tests, we are now giving considerably less chemotherapy based on the biology of those tumors. So everybody with breast cancer does not get chemotherapy, which has been really wonderful. Um, the other thing that we try to uh, implore patients is what I call lifestyle modifications. I call them WWW, my patients should walk, they need to minimize their alcohol exposure or minimize their wine, and weight control is really shown to be vital in prognostics, uh, in contrast to a lot of other things that have been postulated which are less likely to be proven, like supplements and whatnot. I think a big take home here is that we've all stressed is that this is a curable disease, that early detection um, has allowed people to participate in all these walks because we have cured the great majority of patients. We still lose too many patients and we've all been personally touched by that and as, as I have, 
Um, but if we can, if, if there's anything that comes out of this, please get your mammogram. Uh, COVID aside, that's not an issue. You should be getting your mammogram and you should be getting a mammogram every year because it does save lives. Any questions? Well, thank you all so much. And uh, despite my not having uh, requested questions, I actually do have just a couple here that perhaps we can deal with um, expeditiously. Um, one uh, question that came through to me was, um, do I need to request a tumor board evaluation or does this occur routinely? I can't speak for other institutions. Uh, where I practice, essentially every case is presented at tumor board. Helen, Steve? So any center that is accredited by the NAPBC, uh, one of the standards is that you have tumor boards. Um, I think most centers have them that are of any size whatsoever. And I think one of the things that's important about tumor boards is that it's a check and balance. Did right. anybody forget anything? Did we forget a referral to genetics? Oh, is there a second spot on the mammogram on the other side that hasn't been worked up yet? Oh, should we be flipping the order of treatment? Um, you know, is fertility preservation an issue? Did we refer? So there's a lot of minds around the table that make sure important details are not overlooked. So I know NAPBC accreditation means your case will be presented at tumor board. Um, I don't, again, we, we don't know what every hospital does. Yeah, this is really not a cliche. This is the way to do, do it and to do it right. And there are so many different aspects about, of this that Helen just touched upon that you really want everybody to weigh in on this. And, and there are things that one person appreciates that the other person may not, and it does make for better care. I yeah. think, yeah. the, I think the request was really around whether um, this individual needed to request of their doctor that they do it. And I think the answer is it probably would be sensible, but it's highly likely in a major medical center that it would occur automatically. Um, a second question has to do with um, uh, referrals. Um, uh, Dr. Cohn, I think mentioned that um, if a mammogram shows a suspicious um, lesion that um, he, uh, and uh, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but would make a referral to uh, Dr. Pass or another surgeon. Um, I think it's probably true, and uh, I think this question goes to the heart that many women have a mammogram from a radiologist with whom they have no uh, ongoing uh, interactions, and they would get a report, and they do have uh, some connection to their uh, uh, local private practitioner, health, routine healthcare um, person, or they may know a surgeon or no, they certainly would know of oncologists. Um, for a patient that doesn't receive a specific referral, um, is the first stop their um, uh, healthcare provider for, you know, health maintenance, their primary care doctor, or is it a surgeon, or is it, do they seek out a medical oncologist? What do you recommend? Well, it actually depends on the sequence of events. Just to clarify things, when patients present for screening mammograms, and if we see an abnormality, we call them back to work them up. Mm -hmm. So the workup may entail additional mammographic views. It may entail doing an ultrasound. It may entail doing an MRI. Once we have that, whichever designated provider the patient chooses, we let them know that the patient requires a biopsy. Um, if the biopsy is amenable to either stereotactic, which means using mammography, uh, or ultrasound-guided biopsy, uh, we usually tell the clinician and we tell the patient that. And by that time, we've met the patient because when they come back for diagnostic mammograms, uh, we actually either uh, scan them ourselves or we speak to them at the end of their diagnostic procedures and let them know whether or not we think the abnormality we saw on screening was in fact something that requires a biopsy or a follow-up 
or the patient can return to normal screening. So that, that's basically how that works. Then once we decide the patient needs a biopsy, um, if she doesn't have a designated uh, provider, which most patients do, they usually use either their primary care physician or their uh, OBGYN uh, physician, uh, we may uh, tell them from a list to try to get a, uh, a, a steward of the ship, so to speak. Um, in some rare cases, we, uh, we just go ahead and do the biopsies. Um, and when we get the result, we would refer the patient to either an oncologist and or a breast surgeon, usually both. Well, thank you very much. That's all been very informative. I'm so appreciative of your time and expertise. Um, I hope that for those watching this um, uh, presentation uh, by the Israel Cancer Research Fund was of interest. If you'd like to know more about our organization or if you'd like to donate, please go to our website. And with that, I will wish you all good health going forward and good evening. Thank you all very much. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome.